we are going to talk about Darkwater. Yes. The title of this episode. Let's see how we do here. A mother and her six-year-old daughter move into a creepy apartment whose every surface is permeated by water. Mm-hmm. Directed by Hideo Nakata. Written by... The novel was written by Koji Suzuki, which is adapted from... Screenplay by Takashi Ichisi? Ichisi? I don't know. Um, yeah, it's... Uh... Ichisi? Hideo Nakata. I'm just going to move on. Yeah. Um, starring Hitomi Kiroki, Ryo Kano, and Miri Iguchi. Okay. So this was my pick. I had not seen this before. I had known of it. I have... Nice. I'm not an expert in J-horror. I kind of know... and. I, I refer to it as J-horror. J-horror is such a loose term yeah. for Japanese horror. What what I refer to when I think or what I think of when I think of J-horror is those kind of vengeful spirit movies. A lot of them had to do with technology. Creepy ghost girls. Creepy ghost girls. Yep. Uh, dead wet girls is another term for yeah. them. Um, yep. So dead those, girls. those movies that oh, came shit. out yeah, from 98 to yeah. 2007. Kind of kicked off with Ringu and then yeah. like... Went off from there. Went off from there. And then and then the remakes. Yeah, and then we had the American versions of The Grudge and Darkwater and Pulse, I believe, they uh, with uh, Kristen Bell was in that one. Yeah. So when, I, when I'm talking, when we say J-horror here, I think that's what we're refer- mm-hmm. referring to. Not so much a lot of the kind of extreme stuff. And this is specifically Japanese stuff, too, because I think a lot of times people lump Korean horror in there as they well. They do, yeah. which is a different beast. It, which um, is like, yep. Yeah, God, you look through this list of like, kind of, this classic J-horrors, and it's like, Ringu, Juan, Pulse, One Missed Call, The Eye, one Call, I mean, it, yep. Shudder, it's just one after another after another, where like, I remember seeing the American remake before I saw any of the... Because what would happen a lot of times were, and it, in this case it happened, is the American rebake would come out and they would, whoever got the distribution rights to the would original, release the original would release the original along with it. To we used money. to get that at, at the video store all the time yep. and there would always be confusion. Yeah. Yep. Customers would rent <laughs> the, the Japanese and they'd get all mad about it. Yes. And I'm like, well, it, you think we got two copies of the grudge, which is like the big horror movie. Like, come on, like get real. They thought we got two copies of the ring. Right. Like, calm down. It's not out yet. It just came out in theaters last week, dummy. Like, yeah, it's just so fun. I, I miss those days. <laughs> well, you got the ring? You got the ring is here? Yeah. Yeah. So good. Already? How would you get this? Um, <laughs> Wrong one. So here's what I don't want to do. Before we get started, I want to yeah. set the table. Sure. So before we get started here, I want to talk about two key players in this movie. Of course. And two key players in the context of J-horror. Mm-hmm. And these two men are the author, Koji Suzuki, mm-hmm. and director, Hideo Nakata. Yes. I'm going to start with Koji Suzuki. In Please the, do, because I did yeah. a bunch of reading up on him, and I'm fairly certain I'm buying oh, cool. a book or two. <laughs> yeah, um, I have the ring the ring book somewhere. <laughs> the first one? Yes. There's like a lot. Yeah, we'll get it. So yeah. jump in where you want. So um, in the late 80s, Suzuki split into his time being between being a stay-at-home dad for his two daughters and what is called a cram school teacher, which was helping students prepare for college entrance exams. Uh, for fun, he would tell those students made-up stories and pretend that they were real events that happened in faraway places like New York because this was the late 80s, mm-hmm. and we didn't we weren't as connected as we are now, where you could just, where you get news from all over the globe in about seconds if you want it. Yep. So it was 1989, and he used that skill of telling scary stories to write a horror novel about an urban legend, and the book was called Ring, The Ring. Uh, the Ring ended up being a wildly successful, a book that blended modern technology with Japanese myths. It led to people believing in that urban legend and thinking it was true and leading to Suzuki being called and anointed the Japanese Stephen King, mm-hmm. which was a, le- a label that Suzuki kind of winced at because he wasn't much of a horror fan. He's, he's well, and, he, and he, yeah. he left he left horror writing for a, for a while as well. I yes. think he only recently really returned to the horror thing um, yeah. in the last few years um, with another ring yep. entry. <laughs> <laughs> but and and I like when you are successful at something, you make money doing that. Uh, yeah, of course. And so he he also another big thing for him is he got published in the West as a Japanese author, which is no small feat. So, Rare. Yeah. So you got to kind of, <laughs> I, he continued to make, he continued to write ring books, mm-hmm. uh, spiral loop, 
birthday. These are all books. Birthday, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I'm going to get into the I think even titles Pro- of the Promenade ring. of the Gods, I think, has ring-related yep. stuff in it. Yeah. But he also wrote a show story collection called Dark Water. Yes. Which we will we'll get into that in a little it's bit. It's kind of mini like it's kind of like when King I, I hate to do the I know he right. didn't like but like for instance like King would write uh you know individual horror stories then he would have a series like The Dark Tower which was kind of his like magnum opus and then separately from that he would have short story collections where you'd have these nice little bite-sized Stephen King stories that maybe didn't didn't warrant a full, you know, a full novel's worth of content. And that's totally what that book is. What Dark Water is, is Koji Suzuki's cool little creepy ideas that he could kind of yes. drop into this book, this this short story book. So, And he was also, he's like he's like a, he's like a sailor in mm. life, in his life outside of writing. I think it's a book he wrote about sailing, I believe. Yeah, yeah. I think so too, yep. So he's, he's big into water. He loves water. <laughs> this movie loves water too. <laughs> it does. The Ring, his book, wasn't an immediate hit. It was published in Japan in 1991 and then in America in 2003. For the first few years, though, in Japan, it hovered around 500,000 copies. It didn't see a boom in popularity popularity until 1998 when it ended up hitting 1.5 million in total sales, thanks in large part to a film adaptation of the novel Mm. by Hideo Nakata. There was also a television adaptation in 1995 yes. called Ring Kanziban. And I think it's kind of sexy, right? I've seen it. Yeah. And it is essentially a, and I'm glad, because we're going to talk about porn here again in a second, uh, but it's very softcore. Yeah. It's, there's a, it's, it's a TV adaptation in Japan, but in Japan you can. It's like a pink film, isn't it? In a lot of ways. Is that what it is? Kind of. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's, uh, it's worth, a, so if you read the novel, the Ring novel, it is worth a watch to watch that one because it's more faithful than what came after. It's mm-hmm. a pretty faithful adaptation, but yeah. it's also pretty amateurish in some ways. Okay. It's very much a TV movie. It's kind of boring, too. <laughs> um, so I, I bring up the softcore porn because we need to talk about porn. As yeah. We, as we not? love to do. Sure. So we're going to travel back one more time to the 1970s. One of Japan's major studios, Nakatsu, which had... Settled into making a brand of flick called Roman Pornos. Ah. Or Romantic Pornos. So these were um, a little bit, I guess a little bit. Not softer as, touch. Softer perhaps. touch. Yeah. I mean, I'm trying to think of one. Not like a Cinemax, because those aren't always romantic. Well, sometimes they would get a little, Cinemax would get a little romantic. Cinemax is even, even a touchstone these days. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. No, I know what you mean. It's, uh, these are These are a little bit more... Uh, Tell you what, go on Pornhub and type in romantic and see what you get. And then see that's what shows what... up. <laughs> that's what you want. Just don't click any pop-ups. Yeah, be careful there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It was in the 1980s that Hideo Nakata, the director we're about to talk about, got his start as an assistant director working for the company and under director Masura Kano- Kanamura, who by the mid-80s was making cheap hardcore videos with titles like Rope and Breasts and Woman Who Exposes Herself. Oh my. How about that? About that, oh my. And you know what I know about Wikipedia, and I hope uh, nobody was monitoring me because I was doing some <laughs> research. Uh, work on Wikipedia, they will they will put up the uncensored pictures of these movies. Oh there. my! <laughs> so the video covers, uh, they will show you what's going. A woman who exposes herself on the video cover is exposing herself. Interesting. So I went, oh, I I better not look at these anymore. Better click right? that off. Click out of that. Um, yeah. I've bumped into that before. Something like that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> in 1991, Nakatsu, the studio, was on hard times, and Nakata decided to leave the country and take an artistic scholarship at London's National Film Archive to study British free cinema movement, the British free cinema movement, which is kind of like French New Wave for British cinema. Mm-hmm. Nakatsu would, the studio would go under in 1993, so he didn't have a fallback job to go back to. So he set out to become a filmmaker of his own, and he wanted to make a documentary about the director, Joseph Lucy, who was blacklisted. He was a director who was blacklisted in the United States in the 1950s and made movies in Europe throughout the 60s and 70s. To finance that documentary, he took whatever jobs he could get, and much like Suzuki, he wasn't a horror fan at all. He lists movies like The Exorcist and The Omen as influences. But he was more influenced by a lot of those British free cinema movies that he studied. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was the genre where he could find work in Japan. And one of the movies he would make was released in 1995 
much like the first Ring adaptation on TV, and it was called Don't Look Up. Now, Willie, I w- I'm going to read this plot description to you, and mm-hmm. I'm going to see if you can think of a movie that it sounds similar to. Okay. First-time director Toshio Murai is trying to finish a principal photography for a drama. When screening the result of the day's shoot, Murai and crew find that their negatives are intermingled with undeveloped footage from an old film. In the footage, a pale, long-haired woman in white is seen standing in the background of a scene, then laughing hysterically out of focus. A pale, long-haired woman is seen on video. Can you think of a movie that this might sound similar? Is this like The Ring? Yeah, it's a very similar yeah, to The yeah. Ring. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's that's what it sounds like. Yeah. Yeah, no doubt. No, I thought you were going to go with, uh, I thought we were going to like Cigarette Burns territory for a minute there, and I was like, oh, wow. Yeah, <laughs> very similar there, too. Uh, the movie only ran for a few weeks and would be reissued when The Ring blew up. But 1995 was kind of the year to point to when we're talking about the conception, like conceiving of what would become J-horror, which we're yeah. talking about. It's the year, like... It's the year we had sex, and then the people, and we became pregnant with J Horror with three year for three years, and then the Ring came out in 1998. And now we're well, it's yeah, it's, Friday, it's Friday the thirteenth in yeah. 1980, right? It's right. like the year that here it was the initial the initial uh, release, and then it just exploded after that. So yeah, it's there's always that first one that kind of like. That for that one year, that kind of sounds the beginning of whatever is going to be the next. Because it takes studios a little bit of time to go. Oh, to that was on. very popular. Yeah. We got to make this, and it takes yep. time to make it. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Um, so I think talking about the ring is the 1998 ring is best saved for another time if we ever get yeah, to that. But I, I think agree. yeah, it's fair to say the movie that's kind of the movie and the series. I think that and the Grudge for American audiences I think are the ones that are synonymous the most with J horror when it comes to like the touchstones. Um, especially those images of Sudeiko in the ring video in particular, it's kind of the perfect balance of the two men we're talking about, Suzuki and Hideo Nakata. Uh, So let's finally jump forward to 2002. We're in the middle of the J-horror boom in Japan with movies like The Ring, but we've also had sequels like (laughs) The Ring sequels. Oh, my God, the titles for these. So we had the sequels are Spiral, Ring 2, Ring Zero Birthday are a couple of them. Are they... (laughs) It's a mess. I can't even get the. Yeah, it's, get, and then I, there's Ringu and Ringu Two. Yes. And, yeah. And then you have the American versions, which are the Ring and the Ring, the Ring two. two. Yeah. Um, but we also there was also movies like Usamaki. The Ring Two is really bad. It's very and you know who directed it? Hideo Nakata. I know. <laughs> yes. I know. <laughs> he kind of languished after because he came over to Hollywood and yeah. he did not have a lot of luck here. Yeah. Um. So I don't think it was his fault. No. I and sometimes. I just don't think the movie was, like I, I don't think the, but the script it, wasn't there. I don't. I think, think the Grudge, the because um, the director of the Grudge directed the Japanese director directed the American version of the Grudge. I think that works really well. Yeah. So I don't know. It, it all depends. Um, yeah, I don't know. But by this point, we had yeah movies like Uzumaki as well, uh, Suicide Club, Pulse, uh, the two Juan uh, movies that come out on video. Mm-hmm. So. It was in 1996. Suzuki published that collection we talked about. Dark Water from the Murky Depths is what it's called. And then in 2002, Kodakawa Shoten, a media company in Japan, hired to Nakata to once again adapt a Suzuki film like he did with The Ring, trying to kind of capture lightning in a bottle yeah, once yeah. again and being one of the stories from that Dark Water collection, which leads us to Dark, Dark Water. water. <laughs> there you go. I'm I'm done talking. Willie... This is your first time seeing Dark Water? Yes. What did you is. think? I so okay, so I'm not even gonna sit here and tell you like I, I love J horror. Um because I haven't seen enough to tell you I love J horror. What I do love is Japanese cinema. Like I am a big fan of Japanese film. Um and I don't think I've ever seen a Japanese film that I haven't enjoyed to some degree. Like I I I just think that there is such a Japanese culture is inspired in a lot of ways artistically by a Western culture. Um, the beauty of that is that there is an elegance to, I feel like, the Japanese artist's eye that we lack sometimes in the West. There's a softness to the... Uh, there's a carefulness and a delicateness to like like the character work and the um, and the look of the film... There's almost a dreamlike quality to a lot of Japanese films. There's this dreamy, hazy kind of quality about it. 
and uh, this is no exception to that. And I, I just love that look, and I love that aesthetic. And I love that because a lot of these things are inspired by Western culture, and particularly classic Western cinema, classic American cinema, uh, cinema from the 70s uh, through, I would say, the, you know, the, the early to mid-80s, um, you're seeing that classic approach to filmmaking all the way up till through the 2000s in Japanese films. And I think Dark Water is a perfect example of that. I could see some people watching Dark Water and saying, this movie feels like it was made in the 70s. Like, like you know what I mean? Like, it feels like it's it, it's not of its own time in a lot of ways. And that's not a knock on it. That's actually a compliment. Um, it almost feels timeless in a way. And I, a lot of the Japanese cinema, I've watched various types, from everything from, you know... Um, uh, classic, you know, kaiju stuff. I love my kaiju stuff, of course. We've talked about uh, films like Versus on here. Um, uh, even back to Kurosawa, Throne of Blood um, is one of my favorites. I love that. Hidden Fortress is great. You know, like all those old Kurosawa movies. Like everything throughout the course of Japanese cinema, I think, um, has this certain quality about it. And maybe it's just me as a foreigner, like, Looking in on another culture, maybe I just I just have an appreciation for. It. I don't know. Dark Water's no 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 different for me because I started watching this movie and I was like I had this weird warm fuzzy feeling with watching Japanese cinema that I always get when I watch it and it gave me right away. I'm like ah cool I'm watching a Japanese movie I love it like I'm in it. Um, I think it's it's going to be tough to talk about the plot of this movie and break it down because there's not a lot of plot. I grabbed it from Wikipedia. There's not. So it, it, yeah, and it's it's uh, only a few paragraphs, so we'll blow through it pretty quick because there's yeah. not a ton of it. Yeah. yeah, but in terms of, I think the performances are strong. I like the plot. I like the I like the fact that we've got a, a, a female protagonist who is, um, I think she is strong. I think she's she's strong. She's going through hell, um, between her divorce and her fears of losing custody of her daughter. And not being able to trust her own mind because she's had uh, some some break some she had a bit of a mental break in the past that she she's recovered from since then. But people are uh, mistrusting of her and they don't believe her as a um, reliable narrator, or, you know, a reliable uh, uh, person in terms of being of sound mind. Um, it, she's moving into the small part. I just I like her struggle and I like her. I like her, despite everything she's going through, fighting for her daughter, and uh, all the way up to the end. I mean, that's what she, her, she makes the ultimate sacrifice for her daughter. Um, and uh, I love that. I love that through line of, of her as a mother and her as a, uh, as a strong woman, you know, taking her through the movie. Um, I think visually this movie's, this movie is a knockout. Like, the... Like the there aren't a ton of scares in this movie, interestingly enough. There really aren't a ton of them. There's more of that that kind of creeping dread throughout the movie, where you're always feeling uneasy. You're not being jumped at by anything necessarily. There are a couple moments, but for the most part, it's not a it's not a scare filled movie. But it works to the film's benefit because when the scares happen, I think they're sig significant and, and and very effective. Um, the couple scenes in the elevator that I can think of, uh, the hand holding scene on the elevator is the earliest where I just whoa. I, I mean, moments like that, the moment of the elevator closing and starting to lower down, and the door opening, and the girl stepping. I mean, that stuff freaks me out because I can put myself in the shoes of that that character in that moment and go, oh my god, I'd be petrified if that happened. I've always had uh, recurring fears of closing my garage door. Yeah, like going out to my garage. And I've always wanted to put this into a movie if I ever made a movie, which I would never, I'm never going to do. But like going out to my garage, mulling about my garage, like maybe I'm like looking for something. Coming back inside the house and going to shut my garage door, and as the the when the garage door light comes on, the door starts closing. There's somebody standing in the garage, like they'd been in there the whole time with me. Let's just make a short film. That would freak. <laughs> that, that, I have that nightmare all, yeah. frequently, and I look out the window and there's just somebody standing there, and I'm like, oh my god, that person was in there with me the whole time, and I didn't know it, you know, like that. Anyway, that reminded him the elevator lowering with the 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 little girl in the hallway reminded me of that. Um, yeah, no, I, I I like it a lot. I and I 
weirdly enough, I think there's a lot of similarities, for me at least, in terms of the tone and uh, the, the, vi- the, the kind of the, the pacing of the plot and everything reminded me of certain uh, like Italian horror films I've seen before, which is interesting. There's an influence there, I feel like. There's a little bit of that... that there's a bit of that in there. Oh, he names yeah. Um, that re- he names Suspiria as one of his influences that, that's coming here. up too. Yeah, that's in here. And I there's a little bit of like phenomena in there too. There's a bit of that. I just I don't know what. There's not a specific moment or a specific scene or a bit, it's just the tone and the vibe reminds me a little bit of of those Italian horror films. Um, some of those ones that I really enjoy. But anyway, I thought Dark Water kind of ruled. Um, it certainly made me interested in watching. Uh, a little bit more J-horror, some stuff that maybe I'd missed, some stuff that had been remade in the U.S. I, maybe I've seen the remake, and I want to go back and watch the original. Uh, I would be interested in doing that now. Uh, not that I wasn't before, but but uh, I dug this. I thought it was a lot of a, a lot of fun to watch it, and uh, I've seen the Jennifer Connelly one at some point. I don't remember really caring for it. Um, I'd be interested to watch it again just to see, but I don't know when I'm going to do that, I'll be honest with you. Um... But I'm really no, I I dug it, and it was nice. Every once in a while, I like dipping my toes into something that from another country because it just it's just different and it's uh, feels fresh. So yeah, I liked it. Sorry. I no, no, you're lot. good. I, believe me, I I talked enough there for a little bit, so I, I was happy. To, my turn. <laughs> no, you're good. You're good. That was good. You um you almost said something there. You said um you almost said vibe. Um, there's a vibe to it because J horror is a vibe, if you will. It like, is a vibe. It is. It, yeah. it and you kind of have to meet it in uh, meet it halfway in that sense because yeah, especially for a Western audience like us. So, and I think one of the issues with the Jennifer Connelly version that has been talked about, and you touched on it too with Italian horror, J horror and Italian horror. What's different, and I think what's a different mindset for those films, those filmmakers, than what we have here is everything here has to be logical mm-hmm. and has to be explained. And we have yeah, to have yeah, some yeah, yeah, yeah. reasoning yep. behind it. And in J-horror movies and in Italian horror movies, a lot of the time, weird shit just happens. Like, just stuff just yeah. kind of, there's no logic, there's no sense to it. And that's kind of it's a cultural difference. It's a storytelling sometimes the difference. art trumps the storytelling. Yep, and that's something that I think like you 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 I agree with. I think sometimes Western audiences and Western filmmakers have have issues with that. Yes, I and that's been pointed to as one of the problems with that. And Dark Water is a good example with that adaptation or with that remake is it. it it ends up being boring because they're trying to explain everything that happens in this movie, and there's not a proper explanation a lot of times for um, a, a young ghost girl that is, I don't know, like controlling water, and like, yeah, yeah. No. there's not there's not a proper explanation for water demons. Like it, it's just not going to happen. So that's kind of one of those things. The movie itself. So I don't know what it is about. Japanese horror because I sometimes you know me I get antsy when watching movies and I and I go hey come on I want something to happen here mm-hmm. but with this movie and a lot of slower movies like with this movie and especially I never got antsy mm-hmm. and I think it maybe I was drawn in to the relationship with the mother and daughter and because it, it is more of a it's more of a parental drama <laughs> Throughout, uh, oh like yeah, a, par- sure. a mother daughter kind of drama. Yeah, and it's kind of a char- character study too, and it's it's kind of small, and it's kind of uh, like you said, it's shot very romantically, very uh, and dreamlike. And I think that might be another. That might be. I didn't even think about it when I was talking about how this is a vibe that reminds me a little bit of like an Italian horror film. There's a dreamlike quality to a lot of Italian horror as well. Yeah, it's a, there's a surrealism. To what's going on? It's not in your face every time. It's there's a bit of a subtleness to it, but but it's there. It's there. Yeah. And I'm trying to get like I'm trying. I tried to put my finger on why, like saying something like, I don't. Know, I guess House of the Dead, but in some of these movies where I go, come on, let's let's get this moving. Let's get this talking. Good about. example. I, I I remember I remember you uh, mentioning this. And correct me if I'm wrong. I I could be. I remember you mentioning this as an issue you had with um, Haunting of Hill House with the Flanagan show. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Where yeah. you were like, 
I got it. I mean, oh. no, it's a show, which is a little different, but still. But no, this is I. This a lot of this is a problem I have with streaming in general. Yeah. Too, which is, I kind of, I think it's the, it's the over explanation that kind of gets me. And with this, I'm kind of because it's like a vibe. I'm kind of just along for the ride. Mm-hmm. I feel like I'm, I'm not being bogged down with exposition. And I'm not being tried like they're not a, a lot of time when I get antsy, it's because people are telling me things that are happening or going mm-hmm. to happen. And I'm just like, hey, I kind of want to see them happen <laughs> or and even in this movie, it's not in your face about but it sets it up pretty early that, you know, something is off and, you know, there's a spirit like a vengeful spirit there. And they, they hint to it. They cut to it pretty early. And it's always in the background. And it doesn't beat you over the head with it. But it's always there. And you mentioned that creeping dread. It's always along with you. So it's always in the back of your mind. Like this thing is out there while yes. you're watching these characters kind of go through their day-to-day lives and work through that kind of stuff. So um, I really, I liked this a lot. Mm-hmm. I kind of, very few horror movies I can think of that kind. Of, I get kind of, I got kind of like, I don't want to say emotional. Like I wasn't crying. But I did. I, I did. I not cry, but I was emotional. Like like yeah. emotionally affected at the end of this thing, and this one I did, and that's a pretty special thing for a horror movie to do. I'm I'm I really dug that you said that because I was wondering if maybe like I didn't know if it's so like particularly the finale, of course, when she kind of makes that sacrifice, and and the little girl is, and I was wondering. I'm like, I wonder if it's because like. I have a daughter who's not too far off from that age. I was like, is it just me making that internal mental connection? But, like, the fact that you felt that, too, is like, okay, this movie's doing something for every... Like, anybody who watches this, I feel like, can feel that, like... There's the, I don't know. I don't know what it is. It's, it's, you know, that's that scene, right, with the elevator kind of leaving. Yeah, and she's yeah. calling out for her mom. And yes, yeah, yeah I yeah. think it's. I, I think that's an incredible, like, a human thing for anybody to relate to. And I think it's just yeah. kind of watching these two characters kind of struggle through and watching the main character... Yeah. Go through what she goes through, and kind of having to deal with all these outside forces trying to kind of separate her apart. and her da- daughter, and like having it come together, and what she makes. And in the end, they're they're torn apart anyway. Yes, yeah. we'll get to the epilogue. I think we'll talk about that. I uh, yeah. Let's. You yeah. ready to do the plot? Yeah, yeah. yeah let's do it. Just let's, do it. let's, let's knock it out. It's yeah. it's really not. Well, I'm gonna yeah. go through this. Yep. And this is taken from Wikipedia once again, but I we'll talk it. We'll mm-hmm. add our thoughts as we go. Yoshimi Matsubura, in the midst of a divorce mediation, rents a rundown apartment with her daughter Ikuku. Ikoko is it Ikuko? Ikuko in a nearby kindergarten. Yeah, she enrolls in a nearby kindergarten, and gets a job as a proofreader at a small publishing company. The ceiling of their apartment has a leak that worsens on a daily basis. Matsubura complains to the building. I've been in an apartment with a leaky ceiling. <laughs> yeah, superintendent. I that known. But he does nothing to fix it. When she tries to contact the apartment above, she gets no answer. All right, sorry, I had to get through that because that's the end of the paragraph. Willie, tell me about some apartment horror stories. <sighs> vet, this is your time to vet. Because this is also, maybe this is also why I, I got kind of caught up in This is a, a very relatable thing for anybody who has ever lived in an apartment. You lived like in an apartment? Sh- yes. Yeah. Um, we had a leaky ceiling. Twice. Um, it, it was just kind of a bummer and the guy above us, we couldn't get a hold of him. So it was kind of similar to what's going on here. Right. Uh, and the repair guy didn't do a very good job because it started leaking again about two months later. Um, yeah, it was sucked. It leaked into our closet, ruined a bunch of Nikki's clothes. There's nothing more frustrating than water, like water issues. It It is awful. I have a ton of them now. my house. Do you? And it's frustrating because, like, water is, it, this uses it to great effect. Water is like this force you can't control sometimes. No. It's just this thing. <laughs> it's destructive, too. <laughs> yes, it is. Good gravy. <laughs> I've had more issues in my house regarding plumbing slash water than any other kind of issues. Period. I think, I bet that's similar for most people. Um, I've had leaks in this house from the bathtub. I've had a leak from the where toilet. Where we live is a nightmare when it comes to this stuff, too. That, and that, well, that's just Maybe this is why water. we re- why we love J-horror, Japanese horror so much, is because a lot of Japanese horror, because they're surrounded by water Yeah, Japan, yeah, they got to deal with that bullshit all like, the time. And you, like a lot of these um, 
these these vengeful vengeful spirits are like wet, like, yeah. like they come from wells and stuff. <laughs> yeah. We're, yeah. We relate. <laughs> yeah, and we live in a town that was built on a swamp. I have got a. Anytime it rains, by I'm my house, the backyard. It is my neighbors on both sides of me are higher up, and they flood. It floods. So it floods, and there's a lake in my backyard, and I expect at some point some vengeful demon is going to come out. Come out, and so some sort of long-haired ghost girl, <laughs> darker yeah. girl, is going to come out of my backyard. And I'm just going to, uh, I'm screwed now. Oh, she's not here for me. Yeah, because uh, I these I've got some stats on these later on, but these vengeful uh, lady spirits from Japan are OP. They got uh, they're overpowered. Like, oh, they yeah. got all of these sorts oh, of powers. <laughs> absolutely, yeah. They get they got no limitations. Um, but yeah, no water sucks, man. Water sucks. My Ellen Ruck autograph was destroyed. Oh bummer! You had the thing for, her. yeah. Yeah. And, oh, and my Tom Savini autograph. Oh. And my John Carpenter autograph. Yeah, I lost a few of those. So we know what it's like. That's a bummer, dude. Yeah. Yeah. It sucks. <laughs> what are you going to do? I felt bad for Nikki, too, because she lost a lot of clothes. Like, stuff that she had hung up, like, nicer stuff. It just sucked. That was the last straw with that apartment. Anyway, I could keep going forever. It sucked. I'm happy to be in a house, even if it does have occasional issues. <laughs> Uh, str- strange, strange events, rec- strange events recur. A red bag reappears, no matter what, mm. no matter how often Yoshimi tries to dispose. Oh, can't handle that. That's that all. Bag. Yeah, a- a hair is found in tap water. That's just disgusting. Mm. Are you like grossed out by hair and stuff? I can't be anymore. Oh, because of child. No, I live with. Um, my wife has very long hair. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. And hair, I, when you comb and brush and stuff, comes out, and yep. eventually it clogs the sink. It's going to. Right. It's inevitable. Are you grossed out by hair and food, though? I mean, if, like if I'm restaurant? making it, I'm not going to flip out about it. Right. If I go to a restaurant and there's a hair in my food, I'm, I'm, I'm going to have a hard time. Is that... I my mean, wife... If it's a strange hair, yes, I'll... If it's something I prepared in my kitchen... My wife I went to it, but she won't go to. There's a certain restaurant she won't go to mm. be, anymore, and I liked the restaurant. It's over for now. Um, mm. <laughs> I'm not gonna put it. I, yeah, that's yeah, it. yeah. But she found a hair in her soup, and she's like, "I will never go back there. I'm never going back there. I can't do it." I mean, I get it. Yeah, <laughs> I get it. It probably wouldn't happen again. Yeah. Um, but uh, it's all it takes is one hair, buddy, and they fall out. They do. Yeah, they fall out. It happens. So she she finds it in the tap water. I would not be excited about that. Yoshimi gets glimpses of a mysterious long-haired girl around the complex. She becomes regularly late in picking up Ikuko from school and is stressed further when her ex-husband tries to take Ikuko. This was a funny scene. To me. It wasn't funny, but like for a second, I, like I didn't recognize him at first. I'm like, who is this guy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you only see him once before that. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, and his only qual- uh, character trait is that he chain smokes. That's about it. Yeah, and he's not chain smoking in the scene with the daughter. No. So I'm like, who is this guy she's just walking down Yeah, around wandering t- around with. <laughs> Several incidents were behind her of the time she was abandoned as a child. When Ikoko uh, sees a long-haired girl in a yellow raincoat, she becomes ill. Yoshimi discovers a flyer for a missing girl named Mitsuko Kawai, who had attended the same kindergarten as Ikoko, but disappeared about a year ago. Mitsuko had worn a yellow raincoat and carried a red bag. Yoshimi discovers the apartment upstairs is Mitsuko's former apartment. Okay. That's yeah, pretty there. pretty standard reveal. I mean, I don't think there's anything shocking here in terms of what you're, you know, these aren't twists and turns that aren't terribly unexpected, but it all is effective and it all works for me. It's her her performance, I think, and her realization of what is going on around her and that these things that she's seeing and, and experiencing are linked uh, that works. It's not so much about like, wow, what a clever twist. It's more about, like, what... Um, it's more about the performance and the response to that and the direction and the music and everything that um, that I think works for me. I think it makes it more impactful than it might be otherwise. Um, now, this is where... Okay, so the, the the red backpack keeps showing. The little, it's like a Hello Kitty. Not It's not Hello Kitty, but it's like got that... Isn't that a cute little character? Yeah, on it? yeah, yeah. Yep. I don't remember the name. Well, it, it doesn't it have her name on it? The I think it does. Name? Yeah. This is our. This is, by the way. Uh, listen to our sister show, Multimedium, uh, where we talk about another character called Mitsuko from a Japanese cinema battle royale. Two Mitsukos. Both of them are very dangerous yeah. in their respective films. I don't know what it is with Mitsukos, but um, this is, I think, where we get the scene where she goes up to the. 
apartment. This is in that this area. The yes. Ele- the one I was talking about earlier the, with the elevator where like when the elevator goes down, she's still standing. It's like standing there. That freaked me out. So that was good stuff. Yeah, I'll do the next paragraph here. Yeah. Yeah. One day, Yoshimi finds Ikuko in the apartment upstairs, discovering that the faucets have been left running and have flooded the entire unit. Ugh. Can't stand that. Uh, Yoshimi decides to move out, but her lawyer convinces her that moving now would weaken her position in gaining custody of her daughter. Her lawyer talks to the superintendent, who finally agrees to fix the issue after much pestering. After the ceiling is patched, things seemingly return to normal, but Yoshimi finds that the red bag has reappeared. She heads to the building roof and notices that the water tank has was last inspected and thus opened over a year ago, hmm. the same day that Mitsuko. Was I like the last that reveal too. Scene. That's good <laughs> stuff because I actually did not expect that. I don't know why. I just didn't. I didn't. You know, right? The day reveal. Have you watched? There's a. Are you big on documentaries? True crime documentaries? No. Okay. I, <laughs> uh, your wife is right. Uh, yeah. Kind of. Not as much as it used to be, but I think it's because she knows I don't like them. Okay. So there is one on Netflix called Vanishing at the Cecil Hotel. Oh, yes. Um, this is funny. We talked about this. We didn't talk about this. I talked about the ghost adventure, Zach Baggins, where Going he to went Cecil to the hotel? C- Cecil Hotel much better than what I'm sure you're about to talk about. Cause well, <laughs> <laughs> interestingly enough, so the Cecil Hotel, the the the, the, the events of, of that documentary and, and, and the real life events um, happened well after this film was made. Uh, and interestingly enough... The girl that vanished at the hotel was found in the water tank, and people were complaining about dark water, and they were drinking her remains that were coming out of the water tank on the roof for and bathing in it for weeks. So it's it's just a weird. I think even in the documentary, I swear they mention dark water and say like it's kind of weird how it was like. Yes. Yeah. Anyway, sorry. I had to mention Cecil Hotel. Thank you. I forgot all about that. So meanwhile, her ghost. Uh, Mitsuko uh, attempts to drown Ikuko in the bathtub. Okay, so real quick, the term I used it earlier, dead wet girls. Yes. It was <laughs> it was coined by David Collat in his book, uh, J-Horror, which is a good book, and probably the best book on J... I don't want to say that, but it's of the couple that I've read, it's, it's the most in-depth um, when it comes to this, because a lot of them are just kind of like reference books. Like, they'll have the movie and what it's about, and that's about it. And then a short review. This kind of goes in-depth on that. But essentially what they are is it's like Dead White Girls, it, you'll see them in the ring, you see them in Juan. They're like a wronged woman who has been a, like a prom- that figure has been around in Japanese ghost stories for like centuries. So, uh, real quick, I want to mention... I, we 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 had a friend, uh, somebody we worked with at, our, at the video store many years ago. Not Japanese. Um, his his family was from Laos. Okay. Um, which for those who don't know is is uh, near Cambodia and and, and that in that area. Um, and uh, I remember him telling us, uh, not long actually right around when he was there, uh, the second Ring movie I think had come out on DVD and we were talking about it and stuff one night after work and he was saying how. Um, in multiple Asian cultures, the image of a girl, a, a female with hair covering the face in white, is very a very specific cultural fear and a cultural thing. He would talk about how his grandparents would tell stories about you couldn't go into certain areas of the woods because there would be girls, there would be a, a woman out there in white, like a bride in white. A ghost. So it's just interesting to me that like that that visual and that 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 image is something that's actually pretty prevalent in certain cultures. Yeah, and I I think the name for it is Anrio. Yes, uh, Anrio, and it's an enraged soul of a dead who can return. Um, it typically happens when a person dies violently or in the grip of strong emotion. So like revenge, jealousy, hatred. There are male ones, but it's overwhelmingly female. female yeah. yeah. So real quick. Willie, I'm gonna do a. We're gonna have a dead wet girl battle royal. And All I'm right. Gonna, so I told you these uh, these ladies are powerful. They got powers. So Sadeko is the first one. I'm gonna list off. She so she has psychic who, who powers. Who is this? Sadeko, Sadeko, Sadeko from yeah, the yeah, ring. Yeah, yeah from yeah, the yeah, ring. Yeah. Sorry. Um, she has like psychic powers. She can telekinetically burn images onto surfaces or into a person's mind. Um. She she can manipulate DNA and curses. So, Doesn't she kill people by touching them? Too? Yeah, she can resurrect people. 
Shit. She can do whatever. So that's her powers. Okay. Kayoko, she's from The Grudge. The Grudge. Yeah. I'm going to just list these off. She has. This is according to... These two have fought before, by the way. They have fought. I, I mean, I don't remember who won. I watched the movie. I think they merged into one. <laughs> At the end. I think they become like a fused... (laughs) Which we're screwed if that happens. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, She has supernatural speed, supernatural strength, hair attack. Hell yeah. (laughs) So she could use her hair and fling it. Killing intent, um, I think... Uh, oh, you get paralyzed by fear, apparently. Okay. Regeneration, teleportation, shape-shifting, possession, reality warping, illusion. She's got more stuff than Sadek- uh, Sadako <laughs> Yes, technology does. interference and manipulation, curse removal, selective invisibility. I don't know what that means. Curse removal? So, like, if you if she gets cursed, she Interesting. Like, get rid, gets rid of it. Yeah. <laughs> There's also a there's also one called Tomi. So we're having a fatal four way basically is what's gonna happen. Um, she was she was a manga character, but like she can she's a malevolent regenerative ent- entity. She can um, cause anyone, particularly men, to be attracted to her. So she has the power of attraction. Ah. Uh-huh. Um, I'm trying to think. I thought she oh she can regenerate as well. Uh, she could. She's a cannibal. <laughs> But does she eat people or other ghosts? I don't other dead white girls. I think she eats people. Like okay. but it's a last resort apparently. She's fully aware of her immortality too and generally loses it along with her powers of seduction. <laughs> oh my god. And the last one is the one we're talking about today. Uh this is what they have listed for her powers. And All right. Hydrokinesis. That I mean, yes. I mean that she controls. Yeah. Telekinesis. Shape shifting metamorphosis. She kind of does though. Yes. Because she's carrying the her daughter around, and then all of a sudden she turns around. She's like, "Oh, that's not my daughter." Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yep. Manipulation. Possible demonic possession. Mental projection. Super strength. Soul stealing. (laughs) Super strength. I don't even know if that's that's debatable. I mean, I guess the she kind of chokes the mom. The telekinesis, but. so yeah, who do you got? Who do you got in the battle royal? Pick a I'm winner. going with uh, Kao Kao Kao. Kao Kao. Yeah, she's yes. way she's way OP. There's, her list of shit that she had was plus she has hair attack, which yeah. is sweet. <laughs> um, Nikki's in the room and saying I'm lame for picking Kao Kao. I think we're uh, so, okay. So we're into the end here. So ten. Who years, do you have, Tim? Who's your winner? I kind of like. Uh, oh, it's, so they're fighting each other? Yeah thrown down <laughs> the only reason i kind of like the hydrokinesis part, but you know they all live in the water uh, Kyoko. <laughs> yeah, yeah. okay i wish i remembered the movie better when they fought but i know you've seen it i haven't actually I, seen it's it. been a while um it's kind of fun but it's like it makes no sense good. at all good that's for the best <laughs> 10 years later ikuko now at high school revisits the now abandoned block and notices that her old apartment looks oddly clean and lived in she then sees her mother looking exactly as she did on that fateful night, and they have a conversation. Yoshimi affirms that as long as her daughter is all right, she is happy. The daughter pleads to live with her mother, but she apologizes that they cannot live together. Mitsuko appears behind Ikuko. Ikuko turns but sees no one. When she turns back around, Yoshimi has also disappeared. Ikuko realizes that her mother's spirit has been watching over her. And that is the that is the end. Uh, oh, I forgot quick. the part. Yeah, oh, sorry. I forgot the part before it. She's like no, the end of the movie, but whatever. It's all good. <laughs> um, the, the scene of the ghost girl of of Mitsuko choking out the mom with the weird gross face, and it's like, Mommy! It was, that, that freaked me out, too. Mm. It was just gross and creepy. That's a great moment, yeah. Um, and heartbreaking. The little girl crying out for her mom and stuff. That 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 got me. Um, the one thing I wanted to bring up before, yeah. though, was when that torrent of water kind of rushes up through yeah. the elevator. And the, that's an amazing. Really and they talk cool. a little bit, yeah, about that in the special feature I watch. And they talk about how they, I mean, now they do it CGI. And they, yeah. they like, but the little girl s- sat there. While got it blasted came, by water. Yeah, got blasted yeah. by it. The shot, you can tell, it kind of goes over her yeah. and under her. Yeah, it doesn't, so, they don't hit her with it. Yeah, right, but they still, don't hit her. But it it's is, kind of amazing. It's kind of, uh, that's kind of like the iconic shot from this. Yeah, it's sweet. Um, epilogue for me. Yeah, what'd you think of that? Um, I don't. I, mean, I don't necessarily. I, I didn't need it, but I'll be honest with you that if you had ended on just her being motherless and like, uh, it's arguably too grim. Right. So having her at least come to terms with the fact that her mother is because she's figured it out at this point. Like, her mother died, but died died and has lived in this apartment building, haunting this apartment building to keep her safe essentially her whole life so there's a 
it's still sad and it's bittersweet, but there's a there's a there's a nice closure at least there between the two of them. I think I kind of needed it. I did. Yeah, I think you could have ended with just straight up dark, like her mom just died and smash cut to credits. But the epilogue still like, it's still pretty sad. It's like, still yeah. it's very melancholy. <laughs> there's at least a sense of like closure though, right? Which I kind of need. So I think there was a time in my life where I would have been like, yeah, fuck it. no, they should have ended that shit before. It should have been. But now I'm kind of like, nah. I the world's rough enough. Give me a little bit of a... <laughs> give me something. Yeah. So So very cool. That is Dark yes, Water. That is Dark Water. It is on Tubi. There's an Arrow Blu-ray. Uh, um, it's also on Fandor. Oh, Fandor. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Fandor. Um, My favorite streaming service yes. <laughs> that I've never used. <laughs> so Tubi, Tubi has ads, but yeah. it's also free. So there you go. There yes. you go. <laughs> the cat has said, enough of this episode. It's ah, time yes. to move on. He's jumped up on Cloak, Cloak the Black Cat has jumped on and crossed our paths. And therefore cursed us for talking too long about. <laughs> he sounds like the Dark little Water. kid from The Grudge who makes the cat noise. <laughs> yeah, he does kind of sound like him when he meows. It's like the same meow. Yes, I think we've actually. You know what? I think. A Have while you mentioned this before? Back, a while back, I think he did it while we were, and we go, "Oh my god!" Yeah, because <laughs> like his meow is very. It's distinct. like the kid from The Grudge. Holy shit! I never thought about that. Uh, Thanks, Tim. Yeah. Um, all, all right, what are we doing next? Gmail that to have, uh, yeah, Twitter, yeah. Horror Review, yeah, whatever. We're you on all the, the socials. Willie, what Find are us. we doing next? Because it's your pick. My pick, and uh, I'm sorry, Tim. I'm not sorry. You're excited. I know you are. We're going to be Do delving it. into the greatest slasher franchise of all time with its first installment, starring the great Andrew Devolf. <laughs> I, I As, recently saw a video of Andrew Devoff How's he doing? Doing like the Wishmaster voice. Someone asked. Excellent. Someone asked him to do the Wishmaster voice on stage, and he did it. Good for him. Yeah. Uh, as, as the titular Wishmaster. So we're gonna be doing Wishmaster. Excellent. I, I'm very excited for this. I believe one. I believe one of our listeners recently watched all of the. Uh, yeah. The Wishmaster movies. Yeah. God bless him. <laughs> I'm excited. I haven't watched it in a long time. Perfect. So we'll do. Somebody's killed oh. a piano wire, I think, in the movie, if I remember right. So here's get... what's going to happen. We're going to do Wishmaster, and yes. then I'm going to get my birthday pick. Okay. And I don't know what it is yet. I have some ideas. Good. And then we're going to. We, we should announce. I think we should just announce it right now so people can get prepared. Our yeah. plan is to June, July, August on Horror Movie Yearbook. Yes. Do kind of a summer of Cronenberg. Yeah. The great David Cronenberg is returning to horror with a new movie, Crimes of the Future. Very excited for it. And, uh, yeah, we love Cronenberg, uh, one of our favorite Canadians, and we're going to be talking all about Cronenberg movies this summer. So, we've, yeah. yeah, we've got three for sure we're going to do, and then... But we're trying to figure out the rest. We're trying it. to figure out the rest. You'll so. get plenty of Cronenberg. So. Yes. Yes. Perfect. All Excellent. right. Wishmaster, next time. Stay safe out there, everybody, and thank you very much for listening. Mm-hmm.